Welcome to session six of COVID-19, the orthopedic recovery, powered by DOCSF, the Digital Orthopedics Conference San Francisco, in partnership with the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery and the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at the University of California, San Francisco. We're also joined by the American Telemedicine Association, as you probably just heard, as well as the OREF. I'd also like to mention that uh, a special thank you to our DOCSF sponsors. This is our second virtual event, and they were thoughtful enough to join us. Zimmer Biomet, Johnson Johnson, Depew, and Modernizing Medicine have all joined us and providing symposia at the end of the conference that you may want to stick around for. They could look very interesting, and their innovative solutions uh, during this time of recovery are very useful. So look forward to joining that. For the time being, now, now we're at the uh, session six. This is the healthcare economy and what's left of it. And uh, what to expect if unemployment does reach 20% or higher. Um, we're joined by Dr. Kevin Bozick, who is the uh, professor and chair of surgery and perioperative care at the Dell Medical School at the University of Texas in Austin. And Kevin's an old friend and, and very knowledgeable about this area. I want to thank you for coming. And you're going to do us a favor also introducing your other guest, which is Jamie Robinson. All right, Steph. Well, thank you for including us in another great Doc SF conference. I'm um, excited to be here with my colleague, Jamie Robinson, and really appreciate uh, the, the comments and the perspectives that have been shared already on the conference today. Uh, so my, my colleague and co-host here for this session is Jamie Robinson. I think you'll find that he's eminently qualified on this topic. Jamie's a professor of health economics uh, at the University of California, Berkeley, and has a research and teaching focus on clinical innovation and the specialties and facilities that employ them. He has a long-standing interest in orthopedic surgery and has worked with CalPERS on their reference pricing initiative and worked with a number of different organizations uh, on bundled payment initiatives related to orthopedic surgery. So we look forward to hearing his perspective. So uh, Stefano asked us to, to touch a little bit on uh, what's going on in both the U.S. and the global economies in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So let me just start uh, with a question, Jamie, that's on everyone's mind, and that's the economic recovery. So maybe you could start by telling us what the current state of the U.S. and global economy is uh, coming out of this pandemic. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to join. It's great to uh, participate and to uh, we can all speculate together. Anybody that knows the future should uh, rearrange his stock portfolio and buy an island in the Caribbean. Um, so uh the i think the best guesses are that for the u.s over they were expecting uh two to three percent uh gdp growth this year and now they're expecting maybe a three to five percent gdp decline that's called a recession um and the real question is uh what's going to what's going to be the shape of the recovery and the way that economists talk about this is that you can either have a, a v-shaped recovery an L-shaped recovery or a U-shaped recovery. And I'll say, what, what is each of those? And then we'll speculate as to where we're going. A V-shaped recovery is fast down, fast up. Uh, and some recessions are like that. They bounce back very fast. And that's great. That's clearly what uh, everyone would love to see. Uh, the uh, president's re-election campaign is predicated on that. Um, and uh, the, that assumes that we get a, a vaccine up and effective and out there this fall. So if you believe that that's going to happen, you believe in a V-shape. The economy was very strong before COVID. Remember last year, past few years, it's been strong, full employment, rising wages, booming stock market. So it's good foundation. And if you look at the stock market today, you see that despite the uh, very low earnings of the companies, uh, massive layoffs, unprecedented layoffs, um, and a wave of bankruptcies coming our way, still the stock market is booming away. And so the investors who are all investing our pension funds for us, by the way, uh, think that we're going to have some kind of a V-shape. All right, so that's the V. What about the L? That's the negative, the pessimistic. The pessimistic um, version is, is that this thing grinds on and on for years. And what would be the driver of that? That would be that we essentially don't get a vaccine uh, and we don't get a really, a really good cocktail of drugs. 
Um, and so that what we, what we, the social distancing is really the only tool in the kit. And so we distance, we let up a little bit like we're doing right now. Then we get a second wave of infections. We tighten back down, things calm down a bit. We lighten up, we get the third wave of infections and we just cycle through that uh, until we move towards uh, some form of you know, herd immunity, uh, which might be in the uh, 50, 60, 70% having been infected. Uh, rates now are in the single digits, okay, they've been having outside of New York and a few places, it's been low, still low, all things considered. So that's a, gr a grim uh, because there's a lot of businesses that are holding on right now, uh, but that they can't hold on for years like this. And so the, the, the layoffs, the, and uh, also the ability of the federal government to just pour money into the economy is not infinite. The way I view it, the image of what's going on in terms of the recovery uh, policy of the government is you've got a patient on the, uh, on the OR, the patient is hemorrhaging blood, and you're transfusing blood. So you're putting it into the patient's arm, it's pouring out of the rest of the patient. It's just going right through. If you didn't pour it in, the patient would be worse off. Okay, what about the U-shape? U-shape obviously is kind of in the middle. Um, I personally am a, probably a U-shaper uh, in the sense that I think a V-shape, you know, uh, we're just not gonna get that kind of a vaccine that fast. I do note that all the senior executives of Moderna, the leading vaccine company have all sold their stock. I mean, that is not an optimistic sign. Um, and, uh, but on the other hand, the notion that we're gonna be in an L-shape and be dragging on this thing here in the United States for 10 years, also a little different. The, really the question's gonna be is, this is going to uh, accelerate other kinds of deeper transformations that were going on in the economy, particularly automation um, and artificial intelligence. And we see it in telemedicine, but it's everywhere. And that is going to clearly have adverse job implications in the short term, positive ones in the long term. But in the short term, it could, those two together, the social distancing plus just the technological obsolescence of a lot of people's jobs um could be a problem so jimmy let me pick up on on a topic that you just mentioned which is um the the federal uh policy in response to the pandemic um so obviously i think there was widespread agreement that that something needed to be done and and, and w w someone needed to prop up the economy during the short term what are the downstream consequences of spending of the u.s government spending two to three trillion dollars um that we don't have on uh, on this short-term uh, uh, cure, and we understand that you know without it, it would have been much worse. But when are we going to experience the downstream consequences, and what might those be? Well, the, uh, this is all borrowed money, and borrowed money has to get paid back. Uh, so that's the main thing. Um, now, uh, everyone in America loves deficits. We all love deficits. The Republicans just cut taxes you know, a couple of years ago, ma massive deficits. Everybody loved it. Uh, Democrats love to spend money. So um, it's, it's going to be an interesting. I do believe that um, uh, somehow we're going, this is going to have to be repaid by taxes. And there's a couple of bad choices with taxes. There's taxes on individuals, income tax. Uh, and that dampens consumer spending. Consumer spending accounts for 70% of GDP. And uh, the right right now we're giving money to people to go, please spend your money taxing them. Or you put taxes on business, uh, corporate tax. And uh, then uh, that of course uh, encourages them to uh, shift to lower tax parts of the world. Uh, so none of these are very attractive, um, but we do, the, only, the real way to do it is to grow. The economy, if the economy grows, then uh, it's easier to pay those taxes. Um, and what we really hope is that we don't get high rates of interest, uh, because what's keeping the whole federal government economy going, the budget, is that we have a lot of debt but we're paying almost no interest on it. And so that's great. It's actually a good time to borrow. Um, and so, but if the interest rates rise and that we're getting pretty much into speculating about international monetary flows at that point, which we don't need to do.
So, so let me just uh, pick up on that theme as well. So we have uh, international um, participants on the call. What is the um, sort of how has the U.S. economy um, responded vis-a-vis um, -vis other economies, Europe, uh, Asia, and what can we learn from those that uh, that came before us in terms of uh, the economic response and recovery? Well, the only one that really came before us in a real effective way is China, and uh, China has been um, generally a very well-run economy. I mean, if you don't if you don't worry about democracy and individual rights, you could get stuff happening. And so they've, you know, they're back to work and they're producing, they're able to uh, be, uh, use their uh, productivity to offer help to uh, Italy and to lots of countries uh, and uh, drugs and personal protective equipment and stuff like that, as well as money. Uh, so they're the, you know, and, and of course with our president kind of becoming an, uh, anti-globalist, uh, China is taking up, taking up the position wants to be the new world leader. That's clear, and we don't. And so uh, they're all happy about that. We're all happy about that, I guess. Um, I think that Europe, the basis of the, the basics of the U.S. economy are strong. Uh, it's partly because of the technology. We do have our, our bank, our financial system is in pretty good shape. We've, we've got really pulled out of all the recession of 10 years ago. The bank's balance sheets look strong, which is really important in this. Um, and so I, the basics are good. But uh, if we have the stop, start, stop, start um, thing that we have to do over the next several years because we don't lack any better, it's going to be a problem. And what about a lot's been written about the, the government response in Europe, the sort of paycheck protection philosophy versus uh, the U.S. response. And, and, and what do you make of that and how might that have impact the recovery? Well, I think there's different ways of, of putting money into the system and and. Um, uh, America basically believes in the trickle down, give the money to the rich people and lend up trickling down to the poor people and the Europeans are a little bit more, give it to the working people and it'll per percolate up, uh, whether they're different or not. Um, the, the, I, I, I just, the, the big fear for the European economy is not the short term macroeconomic, let's restart, let's get people back to, you know, so they can go out and get a dinner in a restaurant type stuff. It's like, okay, once that starts, once you've gotten there, what's the, what's the engine? What's the real, where's the innovation? Where's the, the, um, the entrepreneurship to the, for the, uh, the industries of the future? Uh, and uh, so Brexit has done, huge harm to the European economy and will continue to. And this, the stresses of COVID have torn, um, you know, at the fabric of, uh, of Europe. And so I am, uh, I'm a big supporter of Europe because it's along with North America, it's the strongest place for democracy, individual rights in the world. Uh, so, but I fear a little bit, uh, that, that they will have, that even if they have a short-term recovery, what's going to be the longer term liftoff for Europe? One last question on this topic, and then we'll shift gears to talk more about the healthcare economy. Um, which sectors of our uh, economy in the U.S. have been hit the hardest and which ones uh, have been spared or, or had the least impact? Well, clearly the ones hit immediately are the ones which involve face to face. Um, and that is the whole hospitality industry, restaurants and all of that and travel, which is a big industry, airlines, hotels, rental car companies all of that um the and then all the services that feed into that all the downstream the suppliers when you think of let's say for example the fishing industry I, we're in san francisco here i'm in san francisco here and we of course have fishing industry uh fishermen are hurting why because uh they sell 70 percent of fish is sold and consumed through restaurants so they are hurting because they're a downstream supplier. They are now trying to do basically farmer's market type stuff, direct to consumers. Consumers are cooking more fish, which is good, but it's no way is it picking up uh, the slack of the, the restaurant industry.
Um, the parts of the industry that are, of the economy that are doing well, of course, are those parts which can be done virtually. This is the whole tech industry um, and um, all of the uh, basically it's the it's the uh, it's, it's, the COVID clearly is affecting uh, the working class much more severely than the professional class because of the ability of people like you and me to keep our jobs, keep working. Whereas people who uh, their jobs involved uh, being outside and interacting with people um, have more f um, adversely affected. Um, where we see need to see bounce back is in construction, very important, and agriculture. They've, we've still got problems getting enough ag labor uh, going out there. Um, so anyway, those are those are parts of it. Great. Well, uh, um, we're going to shift gears to a different topic, but I would ask that any of the participants who have questions on the, uh, the, the macroeconomic impact and the recovery, please go ahead and put those in the chat. Uh, so I want to shift gears and talk about um, a different topic, and that's employment uh, and insurance. So first of all, how has the pandemic impacted the percentage of Americans who are insured versus uninsured and with the insured se within the insured sector, those who are insured uh, through their employer versus the government? Well, the first thing is that the employment effect is a severe, but it's also highly localized, is variable. Here in the, the great state of California, um, the uh, well, nationally, unemployment rate is 15%, um, highest since uh, the 30s. Uh, in California, it's 20%. In Los Angeles, it's 25%. So you just see, um, and this regional, regional effects. Um, The, also, the this is going to move around because we know that the infection's moving around now. That it's, it's coming down in some of the places that's with hotspots and it's bubbling up in mid-sized towns in Georgia, in South Dakota, and places. Um, the the from the point of view we're moving towards talking about the impact on healthcare. It's really about health insurance. The good news is that in the short term, people losing their jobs are uh, about two thirds of them are retaining their employment based coverage. It's partly because the government is subsidizing jobs and partly because employers can remember how hard it was to attract labor only four months ago. In January, we had a very tight labor market. Uh, and so they have, are furloughing people but retaining paying their health insurance, which is great. Uh, for those who do lose their health insurance, we have options. Thanks to the Affordable Care Act, we have the, um, the health insurance exchanges. They are growing enrollment. Uh, and we have uh, better um, expanded eligibility for Medicaid. Now, obviously, this is regional as well. Uh, in the more conservative states, uh, many of them did not expand Medicaid. And so the laid off workers, realistically, to be um, on Medicaid, you have to be a single mom or disabled, basically. Um, and they also have been uh, fairly hostile to the exchanges and they haven't been pushing the exchanges, whereas in more liberal states, they, they have built more of that safety net. So um, insurance is uh, being much less affected than is employment. Also, by the way, Medicare is not directly affected and for orthopedics, certain parts of orthopedic surgery is heavily about Medicare patients. And so no, no change there. Uh, directly. Um, so I would say in the, the immediate term, we're lucky. The insurance system is kind of holding together. If we have an L-shaped recovery, you'll see more and more loss of employment-based insurance. And um, this could, and then that could lead to a more of a tipping point where the exchanges, instead of being the residual for people who don't get employment-based insurance, is almost like employment-based insurance could be more the residual and a, a massive enrollment in these exchanges. Uh, on that point about Medicare, so I've heard that said before. So in, in, in prior uh, recessions, um, as the, the, the economic conditions put pressure on entitlement programs like Medicare, like Social Security, and cause debate uh, in Washington around the uh, how to fund those programs, do you not see this two to three trillion dollar addition to our, our deficit is somehow impacting entitlement programs down the road? Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. Everything's going to be impacted. And um, 
you know, everybody, everybody that gets public dollars is impacted by the public budget. I mean, already at the University of California, you know, there's they're uh, you know, they're just announcing all kinds of cuts. And and uh, so that's definitely. So how does how's it going to play out for Medicare? Medicare is obviously a, a very politically popular program. Uh, and the way that politics and Medicare work out is that the politicians um, uh, never want to directly touch the beneficiaries. They don't, uh, because the beneficiaries are the ones that vote. Uh, and so if they've got a problem financially, they take a swing at the providers. Um, and that's the first and biggest chunk of providers is the hospital sector. That's number one. Uh, number two comes uh, the pharmaceutical companies. After that come the physicians and then everybody else. And so uh, the easiest way for them to deal with, to, to squeeze those sectors is to simply not increase payments. It's always easier to not increase than it is to decrease. Uh, that's very painful in an inflationary time. If we've got no inflation for a while, they weren't plan they weren't gonna be in increasing those payments anyway. So I don't know, but um, it's still not the same as what you see in the, if people lose their insurance altogether, or if people, we might get to this in the other types of insurance, if they really move to uh, insurance designs with, with a lot of consumer cost sharing. So do you see, uh, well, let me ask you then, so that's on, on, the, on the public side, how have the, uh, the commercial or private payers been faring through this? I think there's a presumption that, um, you know, people were avoiding health care and therefore their spending, uh, their their medical loss ratios must have um, decreased considerably uh, during this time. But how are they, how are the, the, the publicly held uh, private insurers faring? They're doing great. They're great. It's just, so, it's just absolutely true. They, uh, their premiums were set last year based on certain expectations. And then suddenly people stopped going into the doctor or to the hospital. And uh, they actually, are, of course, they're paying for COVID care, but uh, outside of New York, there just hasn't been that much of it. Uh, so they're, they're doing very well, thank you. Uh, they are worried about what's gonna happen next year. Um, they're worried about a couple things on the next year. First of all, will there be a big bounce back of people flooding back in, in the fall and in next year, uh, wanting the care that they've deferred? And how much of it is deferred and how much is, is never? You know, when's it coming back now, later, never? Uh, they have to. They have to predict that, and they're also uh, worried about uh, pricing uh, from the providers because the providers are hurting very bad right now. As you know, um, volume is way down, and uh, so the providers. It's very hard to imagine that they're going to come up with any better idea than let's consolidate further. Let's have hospitals employ any remaining non-employed doctors. Let's do a bunch of mergers and then let's raise prices against the commercial carriers. They can't raise prices against Medicare and Medicaid effectively. So that, that, that could happen. Um, so insurers have to try to figure that out. Do you see, do you foresee um, a decrease in in healthcare spending per capita and health per care spending as a percentage of GDP in the U.S., given that uh, you just mentioned GDP is expected to decline as well. Um, as a percentage of GDP, healthcare is is um, probably going to rise. It's projections. It's, it's right now. It's been around seventeen and a half percent somewhere in that of GDP fluctuates a little bit. Uh, so projections that go up to around twenty one percent, mainly because of the denominator. Um, in terms of the numerator or spending per capita, um, I think it's going to go down. Uh, that's if you think about what's happened over the past decade. Ten years ago, we had the big recession, and uh, what happened in, from healthcare, how the insurance. Well, uh, in that next ten years, there was this huge shift of, of uh, benefit, that, you know, enrollment into high deductible health plans that really surged during that period. Uh, employers, uh, you know, they're not that creative. They thought, gee whiz, I've got a deductible at 250. Why don't I just raise it to 1,000? Oh, why don't I raise it to 3,000? I mean, that's, that's kind of like the level that they're talking about. And so that's what they did. 
And then consumers look at that and they don't feel all empowered and skin in the game. They just feel like, because most uh, Americans don't have 500 bucks in their savings account. Uh, so they, they use less care. And so we've had a relatively slow growth in uh, the volume of care per capita over the past decade. We have seen increases in prices uh, because the providers have been smart and they've consolidated and they monopoly power and all that. So uh, we could see more of that. We could see more of that. We use people who have thin, what we call thin insurance, uh, they can decide that they're not going to pay their deductible. And that does hit orthopedics because you've got a lot of procedures that uh, will, will drive the patient right to their deductible before they get to the elevator. Okay, and so you're going to have a whole lot of people saying to themselves, yeah, my knee really hurts, but uh, is this where I want to put $3,000 of my deductible right now? And ditto for spine, especially for spine. So that is going to, I feel if I was in, in trying to figure out, prognosticate orthopedic volumes, I would uh, be looking at that. So you'd you'd be predicting a decrease in demand because of the the out of out of pocket uh, responsibility of the insured. Yeah, I mean, there's going to be a bounce back. There's a lot of deferred care that is going to bounce back. So when patients feel it's safe to come in and doctors feel it's safe to op operate again on schedulable cases, uh, non emergency schedulable cases, uh, that's going to come back. Um, but the trend line. Um, is, is I, and I'm speculating, but uh, it's this it just can't be good. This cannot be good for volumes. Yeah, and so let me just one, ask one final question on that, and then um, I'll, I'll ask uh, Stefano if we need to leave some time for uh, for questions. But so again, back to employers. So a lot of the shift in pressure from both. Uh, the government payers and the uh, employers towards value where orthopedic surgery has really been at the forefront and been, been first uh, really first movers in that space, both in terms of the delivery model and the payment model. A lot of that pressure came from the perception that uh, healthcare spending per capita uh, was too high and employers were feeling pressure that they were spending um, too much on healthcare uh, and it was an easy place to cut. So you've told us that you think healthcare spending per capita is going to be going down, so maybe less of a spotlight on that in the short term. But you've also told us that em uh, employers are really hurting uh, and really struggling. Do you think that increases or decreases pressure on on healthcare and and transitions to uh, alternative payment models and other uh, other systems for delivering care? I think that the the pressure is going to continue because the government, Medicare, and uh, the government, the private employers and insurers, they're all feeling stressed. I mean, the, the, the private insurers have a short term boost, but basically they're going to be stressed. And so they're going to be looking for things that moderate the trend. I think that uh, from it's incumbent on the profession and uh, I appreciate you, you know, you're a leader in this and there's others in the orthopedic surgery that are leaders in this to say to the to the profession, listen, we have to change our way of doing things and we've got to be able to come to the to the buyer and say listen i don't deliver my little procedure i'm part of a group that delivers musculoskeletal care and i'm willing to stand by that i'm willing to i'll measure quality you can measure quality whatever and we're going to have some sort of bundle payment and we will uh be accountable for the cost of that and because when you look when you think about the um, let's go back to, you know, you and I have worked a lot again on reference pricing. Reference pricing came right out of the recession 10 years ago. State of California, basically bankrupt, turned around to the state employees program and said, spend less. State program turned to the consultants. The consultants said high deductible. The labor union said no. Okay. So they said, what else can we do? And so they said, let's look, at, let's look at our data. And they found this incredible variability in the prices charged by hospitals for orthopedic surgical procedures. And so they said, okay, we're going to set this thing up so that the, the patients that pick the, 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 play, the places charging less than 30000 it's going to be a, a generous. And if they pay a place that charges more than $30,000, they will pay 
the entire difference between 30,000 and whatever that number is. And gee whiz, patients, once they started uh, spending their own money, they moved. And the doctors did too. The doctor, this, this, this didn't apply to doctors because the doctors were all charging just the fee schedule. They weren't uh, getting any of this big, uh, say, a big money out of the hospitals. So it really worked. But it's very limited because that was just for the procedure. What the buyers really wants to say, we want to do that, but we want to do it across what Michael Porter at Harvard, who you work with, calls these integrated practice units. Really, you know, call it surgical units that include the procedure, the pre-op, the post-op, physical therapy. And of course, in the, in the current era, we're all going to, um, a lot of that um, and stuff is going to be virtual because you can do a lot of good things uh, with e-visits e and other things for the pre-op and the, po the post-op monitoring. So I think it's an opportunity. And I think that, uh, uh, but it is going to have to be uh, something that saves money. You know, it's quality, it's improving quality is what gets the doctors engaged. Saving money is what gets the buyers engaged. And on that note, and we're going to shift back to Steph here in a second, is, you know, I think so what you're telling us is this does create an opportunity for innovation from our profession, as we've been doing uh, all along since that that last recession. And we've really been leaders through our, our co-sponsor of this uh, of this conference, the AAOS, in the, the making the transition to value. Uh, and so it sounds like your your belief is that we have uh, we may have an even additional opportunities for innovation coming out of this pandemic. Yeah, so, I just, to, just let me say something just on yeah. that. Everyone's talking about, OK, one of the big deals about the, the epidemic is it's going to really be a tipping point for uh, virtual care, you know, telemedicine. Which, which it is. But telemedicine is, and which is great, uh, is only a bit of what, the, of what the real expense of healthcare and the real quality. And so you guys are, you, you guys are where the, you know, the, frankly, the dollars flow. And so putting that together, having virtual be part of it, but using this as a tipping point, I'm hoping, I hope that the COVID epidemic will be a tipping point for value-based orthopedics. You know, a value-based uh, musculoskeletal care generally, but it, it's up to, to the profession to do it. And like I say, you do it or it shall be done to you. Yeah. Jamie famously said to me one time, healthcare reform will either happen by doctors or to doctors. And so it sounds like there's an opportunity to, for it to happen by doctors. So I'm going to turn it back over to, to Steph and uh, he'll, I'm sure, get to some questions. And I have some additional questions if there's time, but I'd like to hear from others. Yeah, absolutely. Though. Thank you very much, you guys. I, we could have gone on forever, but thanks for giving us that. We do have seven questions. I just ask them as they're written, and uh, some of there's a little bit of repetition from what you've already said. So the first one, uh, Dr. Cummins, how do you think COVID-19 will affect medical research funding? I think you've sort of alluded to the impact of debt on healthcare spending by government. When you want to want to address that? Well, what I hear in the world of the funding agents I do is if you don't have the word COVID-19 in the title of your research proposal, you are not going to get funded. So if you're, if you're researching COVID, you're good. If you're researching anything else, we're starting the lean years. That, that's been our experience as well in both health services research as well as translational research that all of the funding, not, not most of it, all of it is being diverted to COVID-related research. Hmm, fascinating. Um, from Richard Capra, what is the long-term situation between insurers and hospitals and what will change? I think you hinted at it, but it just goes straight to the heart of the matter. Do you think there'll be a change in the way insurers and hospitals partner in the delivery of health care? Well, I would like to think so. And I know that the, the best provider system, I think, in this current situation is uh, – is the Kaiser Permanente. Um, I've been doing a, a paper with Kaiser on, on their experience and they, because the, the Kaiser health plan stands with the Kaiser hospitals and the Permanente doctors, they're not, you know, they're not cutting them off. So uh, they are able to do all this re-engineering of care and uh, they're, uh, and that's what and, you know. They have to. They, you know, they've got stresses too. They, they got. They have to worry about membership losing their insurance, and you know, they've got, they've got issues to do. But um, 
I found it really unfortunate that when, like for example, United Healthcare, they're about to break the law, violating the medical loss ratio of the Affordable Care Act because no patients were getting care. So they were in violation of the MLR. Boom. What did they do? The principle of the MLR is the money needs to go to the doctors and the hospitals. But they didn't give any money to doctors and hospitals. They gave it to employers in the future pay down of their premium. So that gets them business going forward. Nothing wrong with that. But I mean, it, it didn't help the doctors in the hospitals who are bleeding right now because they're empty. They're empty. That's the problem. So we really want the hospitals, I mean, the insurers should take, and I don't know how to do this in the environment that we're at, some accountability for their network core. They should have their, their best providers, ideally the ones that were integrated, as we were talking earlier, into these integrated practice units and we're taking accountability for quality and cost. Keep them whole. So along the same lines, because the insurers had a significant amount of the sitting on a lot of cash, and you did guys both talked about one reason why they probably want to keep that cash because they're concerned about that care coming back down the road. But the question from Nico here is, do you think payers will take that money to vertically integrate care and acquire distressed care delivery assets? You, you see that this financial structure will sh cause a shift of insurers going into the delivery side. I think that there's, there's some of that just going on anyway. Uh, most most obviously, uh, United Health Group, through its Optum Care division, is um, uh, has several thousand uh, physicians who are full time employed members of groups that are owned by Optum Care. I mean, there's all these legal things, so they're not actually working for Optum Care. There's corporate practice and all this kind of stuff, but they're very aligned with um, that, and it is working, uh, to my knowledge quite well. It's a very big deal here in California, in Southern California. Uh, some of the most famous medical groups are now affiliated with Optum. Um, and you see some elements of that. You see up here, uh, uh, Blue Shield, Anthem, making investments. I think a, a lot of it is actually a fear of hospital consolidation. It's really what's going on. And uh, they would like, they um, uh, would like to keep alive uh, physician entities which are not um, uh, hospital centric so that they can do the things like favor ambulatory surgery over a hospital based outpatient, you know, that the usual kinds of things. Thank you. One more question. You may have sort of answered it, but let me, it's, it's come up. So let me just bring it back. And um, the probability of inflation impacting Medicare costs this has phrase as cost as opposed to premiums, but um, you probably think of it both ways. Yeah, well, that, first of all, we don't know whether, we've been waiting for inflation for several years now. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Uh, this is like, uh, interest rates are, uh, they range between zero and negative. It's really unbelievable, it's amazing, historic. Um, if those interest rates go up, the federal government is in very bad shape because it then has to divert money from Medicare, from the military, uh, et cetera, to debt financing, debt servicing. And so uh, we certainly hope that we somehow collectively pay down a bunch of our debt before the interest rates go up. <laughs> <laughs> With that hopeful thought, yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> um, and we're getting uh, we're getting into the last sixty seconds. Uh, Kevin, you said you had a couple of questions you wanted to ask. I'm going to give you the last one. No, I'll just I'll just say that you know I think this has been a, a great session. I think that what we've heard is that the a lot of these uh, entities are really interrelated and intertwined, and so. Um, whatever we see, we, we, we see that healthcare was likely to be a bellwether um, for the rest of the economy. Uh, I'm really proud and excited that orthopedic surgery with uh, uh, Stefano's leadership and the AAOS is, is really trying to be proactive about driving uh, forward with solutions. And I'm, I'm really encouraged and optimistic that we will um, come out of this uh, better than we were before. And so thanks again for including us and, and thanks for all the, the questions that came uh, from the audience. Uh, and uh, look forward to uh, the rest of the conference. 
Thank you, sir. Thank you both. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. And uh, we will move on to the next session and uh, we'll have a usual five minute break and I look forward to seeing you there. Thank you so much, everyone.